The voters have spoken as we're listening to a little Al Green right here, a little Let's Stay Together. They want to make things work with their old congressman. That's right. Democrat Tom Suozzi will now represent New York's third congressional district after yesterday's special election. He replaces disgraced, expelled George Santos to complete the remaining 11 months of his unfinished term. Joining us now to break down what this means is Lawrence Levy, one of our good friends here, executive dean of the National Center for Suburban Studies at Hofstra University. Larry, great to see you. Yeah, always great to see you, Chris. So uh, what does this mean for House Republicans now that they have flipped this seat? Well, you know, this was a big win for Democrats and probably a bigger win for them than it was a loss for the Republicans. And what, what I mean by that is that, yeah, the House Republican leadership now has one more seat to worry about if they try to bring up a controversial matter. But that's something you can control, uh, you know, as a speaker has a lot of power over the legislative calendar. But for the Democrats, I mean, at a lot of levels, this was really important for them. Uh, locally, as you've seen the last three years, Republican Party has absolutely counted them in the suburbs. Arguably, uh, the seats lost in New York were uh, enough to flip the control to Republicans in Congress. So, you know, it, it was a morale victory for sure. It, it means that when the Democrats redraw the lines and the gerrymander coming up for November, they don't have to worry about this district. They can find Democrats to pump up other districts. And I think that uh, it, it was arguably a, a, a bellwether, you know, for Democrats all around the country, uh, particularly in the swing suburban areas that tend to decide national elections. Uh, uh, and, and the lessons here were basically, if you want to win in moderate areas, you run moderate candidates. Uh, if you want to appeal to voters who shy away from you know, extremism of any stripe, you run somebody who has an image as a uh, consensus builder. How important was it for this district, though, to quote unquote, get it right after that disaster with George Santos there and, and voters essentially not even really looking into this guy's credentials whatsoever, just checking a box. They didn't want a Democrat. They wanted a Republican. And it didn't matter who it was until they found out who it was. Right, Chris, the uh, original, you know, the early Republican tactic of keeping Mousy Pillip under wraps and not uh, uh, speaking, uh, have her not speaking much about national or international affairs, you know, to keep the spotlight on Swazi and the Democrats, it, it didn't work. Uh, it, it enabled Swazi to raise the question of, hey, you know, you got burned a couple of years ago by voting for somebody you didn't know very well. Uh, why would you want to do that again? I don't know if that was decisive, but. Larry, let me ask you this. During the campaign, Swazi took a little bit of a different stance on immigration than most Democrats have. What can we expect the rest of the party to do as far as it relates to this playbook come fall? You could expect the rest of the Democratic Party to take a page from Swazi, but you know they were already doing that. I mean, the compromise uh, uh, bill that they put forward didn't make a lot of Democrats happy, but they felt it was a way to move it forward. And ironically, even though it didn't pass, it helped Swazi because he was able to say, I'm a compromiser, I would have supported it. And I thought she made a tactical mistake in saying she wouldn't. She just could have said, look, I'll, I'll take a look at it. I, I'm a compromiser, I wanna see the fine print. But she gave him the chance to go on a counteroffensive on the immigration issue, uh, you know, where he was in a defensive crouch for weeks. And just final question for you, Larry, before we let you go. This election yeah. year, what do you think this really says overall about how voters are feeling ahead of the 2024 presidential election? Again, you know, we used to talk about this red wave taking over Long Island. This is a little bit of blue. Um, but, but what does this say overall, do you think? It says that voters in um, these suburban swing districts are still up for grabs. I mean, there's plenty of red and plenty of blue people who are never going to change their minds. But there's a preponderance of moderate independents who are going to listen to what the candidates have to say. They don't want to hear extremism. They don't want to hear a lot of ranting and raving. They want, uh, you know, as Tom Swazi tried to present himself, problem solvers. And if both parties could learn from that in the candidates they pick, in, in their tactics and strategies and messaging, if they want to win these districts that decide who gets the gavel in Congress and maybe even the keys to the White House. Yeah, got to cut down on the crazy. That's probably a safe bet. All right, Lawrence, thank you very much. Great to see you, the Executive Dean of the National Center for Suburban Studies at Hofstra University. Mr. Levy, we appreciate it. Good to see you. Always to see you. All right. So I'm going